to, to organize the, the Midventions program and this lecture series. I think it's, um, it's, it's hugely uh, important, uh, not just that, uh, you know, companies like Canavi get built, uh, but that also we, we build a, a medical device ecosystem in Canada, and uh, that involves sort of passing uh, down information from people that have sort of gone through the process or going through the process to those that are just probably starting out. Um, so this is probably my seventh or eighth or ninth, I've, I've lost count, uh, number of times sort of speaking uh, as part of the, the Medventions program. Um, every time I come, I like to talk about uh, something, you know, finance and business development related. Um, and this year is no exception, but this year I'm gonna take a slightly different approach. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna reflect on sort of the, the past 10 years, spent a little over 10 years in the medical device industry. Uh, and oh boy, how has time flown? It's gone by real quick. Um, but, but really sort of reflect on, on what it is that I've learned and, um, and, and again, sort of impart that wisdom on to you know, those, those that are listening. And, um, uh, and yeah, and, and I think one of the things that I'm gonna sort of impress upon you today, I mean, there's a lot that I've learned, uh, but it, it sort of falls under kind of uh, two buckets. Um, there's kind of really, really high level strategic things. And then there's sort of minute operational tactical things. And I, I've learned a lot in, in respect of both. Uh, but really, I want to impress upon you some of the really, really important strategic things that I've learned, uh, because, and it's been a little bit of a rude awakening for me, but if you don't have these strategic things absolutely narrowed down, um, it doesn't matter how good you are tactically, uh, you're not going to succeed. So anyways, I'll explain a little bit of, uh, about that as we go along. Um, but that's, that's really it. And I think, again, if you kind of get the big strategic picture, that's going to um, allow you to, to sort of build and develop products that are really attractive and the capital will follow. So that's gonna sort of try and impress upon people today. So some people might be uh, familiar uh, with uh, someone named Ray Dalio. Um, uh, Ray, is, uh, Ray Dalio is a, a well-known investor. He runs a, a, a fund called Bridgewater Associates. It's a hedge fund. Uh, but he's a little bit kind of different. He's got a, kind of this philosophical bend to him. And, and probably about, I don't know, 20 years ago, he, he wrote this, um, this white paper that he put online called Principles. It's since been published. It's quite popular. And, and Principles, it's all around um, just sort of like he, what he did was he, he kind of took an inventory or stock of his, of his life, all the things he had accomplished, and said, you know, what are those things uh, that I believe in that I adhere to? Uh, that have, you know, helped me be successful. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, a lot of people um, now sort of subscribe to this, uh, uh, to, to this thinking. It's, it's interesting because he's kind of done, you know, a set of principles for, um, uh, you know, sort of like managing people and managing organizations. And, and this is what I'm going to explain sort of falls in that bucket. But then he's done other ones, uh, economic principles, like how to manage debt crises and things like that. And those principles, around, you know, for example, how to manage debt crises is one of the reasons why Bridgewater has been so successful. Um, but one of his sort of core principles is this idea that, you know, in life, you sort of, you have experiences and you go through them and they don't always turn out exactly as planned. And in fact, in many cases, you know, if the last two years has taught us all anything, it's that life rarely ever goes according to plan. And he basically says that there's there's kind of two ways of, of looking at this is you could be presented with uh, um, sort of, you know, an experience where, you know, again, things have not gone according to plan. Um, and, and you can either kind of take stock of it, reflect on it, um, figure out, you know, what happened, how you can change and then make progress, or you can just kind of sulk and let it defeat you. And I think the thing is, is that you know, for my 10 years in medtech, for example, a lot of missteps, a lot of, and that, that's pretty much common of everybody. It was interesting. This was several years ago, pre-pandemic, I was having uh, a lunch with a bunch of people and Chris Shaw was there. And some people might be aware that, you know, Chris and, and Frank recently sold Bayless and did extraordinarily well. Uh, but Chris Shaw said, um, you know, if there's, if there's 10 core mistakes you can make in medtech, we've made 11. Uh, and, and that was actually an expression that he borrowed from Arun Menawad, who now runs Profound, used to run Nodak, who's also been very successful. So the, the fact that people in this industry, it's a very challenging industry. 
uh, you're going to make mistakes. It's like, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the, the question is, what do you do with those mistakes? <laughs> do you sort of sulk and let them defeat you? And I've seen a lot of people that kind of get into this industry and it's overwhelming and it's too much. And they go for something simpler because quite frankly, if you're looking at trying to maximize output versus input, medical device isn't really where it's at. And it's kind of like medicine. Like, why would you stay in school till you're 35 if all you're worried about is, you know, what your paycheck and work life balance and, and something straightforward like that? Um, but I think it's this process of, um, you know, again, going through experiences, figuring out what you've done wrong and then correcting them. So I think this is a key part. And it's one thing to keep in mind for everybody as you sort of go through your med tech journey. Uh, things will never go according to plan. You were just going to constantly throw curveballs. Um, so I think, again, the biggest sort of learning that I've had, and, and it's sort of a little bit of a, maybe a visceral concept, or it's not really, really tangible, is this idea of the difference between strategy and tactics. And I'd say that, you know, when I got into the, to sort of the industry, I had a, a you know, decent set of tactical skills. So that's things like, I mean, obviously you have a finance background. So, you know, if it's, if it's um, you know, financial statements or even a cap table or things like that, I had a pretty good knowledge, a working knowledge, or I could learn them pretty quick. Other tactical things, IP, reimbursement, stuff like that, you know, also could kind of figure out quite quickly. But what really kind of um, took a while to really, really, really sink in were some of the big strategic themes in, in medtech. And, and, you know, to get to, to sort of the strategy and, and tactics, they can be a little bit interchangeable from a sort of colloquial standpoint. But really, and I, I came across this, um, uh, this um, uh, um, excerpt from The Art of War that I think does a, a reasonably good job of explaining the difference. But essentially, strategy is, I mean, imagine you're, you're just, you're in a boat and you're trying to get from point A to point B. Um, Tactics is, you know, how do you row? How much effort are you putting in? Like, what's your technique and stuff like that? Strategy is, are you pointed in the right direction? Um, and you can, you know, again, you can be, um, you can day to day operational, you can have everything, you know, go right. But if you're not pointing in the right direction, you're not going to be successful. And you do need both. Uh, you do absolutely need both. But I, I think the thing is, is like, the what I've I've come to to learn over time is the people that I've met that are most successful in this industry, um, they they have just a, I mean tactically they kind of delegate they have people that do things for them they know enough to be dangerous but they're not necessarily in the weeds, but strategically they don't make any mistakes because you tactically you can afford to make mistakes, strategically you can't because that is sort of like the big picture stuff. And if you're not pointed in the right direction, um, you will screw up. So that's sort of what I want to press upon today is, is sort of the, what I think to be kind of like the big strategic theme of med tech that is most critical. And, and I think, you know, one thing to consider is a lot of people on this call that maybe or this, uh, this uh, session, you're thinking about maybe starting a company. So that's that's really important. Obviously, you want to be aware of these strategic things. But there's a lot of people that aren't and that's fine i mean i didn't i haven't started a company i've been involved sort of two at the very early stages but i've never actually been a founder uh, but even if you're an employee you want to make sure that this strategic stuff is being done properly because your trajectory as an employee is is very much determined by the trajectory of the organization i mean the, the way the organization is trending essentially sets a ceiling and, and your your career can only go as high as that so this is probably again if like i, I think the big, big, big strategic thing that I have learned, and not just learned, but like really kind of badgered into my brain over the last 10 years. And I knew this kind of going in, but I believe this to be about like to med tech, this is immutable in the same way that, you know, I don't know, like the F equals MA is immutable in physics. Like this is, I believe to be undeniable. And what this is, is that the med tech ecosystem, the med tech world is all set up, all startups are basically born bred, created, funded, and then eventually acquired by multinationals. It is this whole cycle. Medtech startups are not meant to sort of be created and then become standalone entities and, um, and sort of exist on their own. They're really not meant to be standalone companies. They are meant to be swallowed up by the big acquirers. And this is, I mean, this is I'll explain to you why this is the case, but this is you know very much empirical. If you if you look at the vast majority of medical device startups that end up 
um, you know, A, getting funded and B, doing well are those that are eventually acquired. So let's look at an ecosystem. So what, I mean, one of the challenges is Canada doesn't really have a rich ecosystem. So we have to sort of look at Minneapolis or, or Boston or areas that do. So you have these multinational companies. So whether it's Medtronic, Boston, Stryker, whomever, Intuitive, et cetera. And they, uh, their operations, I mean, they do R&D, they do business development, they do quality, they do everything. So what they're really, really good at is bringing people in and training them and getting a lot of really good skill talent. And one of the things that we talk about in Canada is the lack of skill talent. And why is it? It's because we don't have a lot of big sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of anchor medical device companies that are training people. Right. Um, I mean, you look at Bayless, uh, you know, that's probably the largest. And, and I think that did a really good job of sort of training people and spitting them on the ecosystem. Canabi, I think, you know, again, we employ 80 some people, uh, but we don't have companies like, you know, Medtronic and whatnot that employ thousands of thousands that are essentially paying people to apprentice and then create these really, really rich pools of, of talent. So, so what happens is you get these people that spend, you know, five, 10 years working for Medtronic Boston, they kind of learn the ropes. And then they say, okay, I want to go out and I maybe want to launch a company. And they don't do it necessarily independently. Maybe they're working with researchers at an institute or something to get some IP. But the important thing is, is that they've had experience first before starting companies. So then they're in a position where they start these companies and they're in a, you know, they, they create new products because that's sort of also along the lines of what they did these multinational companies. The idea of creating a new product is not something that's completely new to them. Again, they've been through this process before and eventually they get swallowed up, they, they get acquired um, and the cycle kind of repeats itself. Now, the, the way this, this cycle kind of, um, the, the reason we talk about how hard it is to raise capital, and it is, it's extraordinarily difficult. But the reason this works so well is because this model absolutely fits the mold of what a VC is looking for. A VC is looking for an exit in a defined time frame, and uh, they are looking for skilled people to run it. So think about it, like if you're in Minneapolis, and you got all these people that Medtronic's training, and some of them, you know, go out on their own and start a company, but they know how to build products, they know the types of products that Medtronic wants, then what you say is, okay, you give them, you give them money, and then eventually maybe when Medtronic or somebody else buys it, you get the money back plus you get a return. So this built by ecosystem is an extraordinarily powerful gravity. And I think it's, again, one of the things I thought, you know, oh, okay, you can start a medical device company, maybe you get acquired, maybe you don't. But quite frankly, and I'll explain this, if you don't have a really, really, really clear path to an acquisition that um, a big multinational really likes, A, it's going to be very difficult to build a valuable company, and B, you're just not going to raise capital. So if you can kind of, you know, if you can start with the end in mind, it really kind of simplifies the whole process and provides a great degree of clarity. And I think one of the things that Canadian companies have struggled with is a lot of us like Canavi have kind of said, well, we need to be the anchor company. So we need to be standalone and whatnot. But it's just really, really, really hard to escape that gravity because every VC that's looking at you um, and even strategic or other funding sources, or they're going to say like, what is really the path to acquisition? And as I sort of explained, like, I mean, there are multiple ways to actually, you can get acquired, you can IPO, but the way you kind of build most value is just you get people that want to buy you. Um, and if you get people that want to buy you, you can always say no, um, but without that, you just, it's really, really difficult to build value for shareholders and value for investors. So this thing is, again, I, like for me, I look at this and I'm like, Trying to defy this is extraordinarily dangerous, is extraordinarily, it makes life like so much more difficult. If you just follow this route to say, I'm going to build a company that will eventually be acquired, I think you're in such a better position. Now, again, we don't have all the skill talent like they necessarily do in the United States, but I think through efforts like this, through other companies that employ young people or, or, or people at the beginning of their career and give them a chance, we're starting to feed this loop a little bit. So, and so, everything strategically for me emanates kind of from, from this slide right here. So, so I've talked about this. You have to, when you start with a medical device, 
company, you have to begin with the end in mind. And the end in mind is you know, who's, who's potentially going to buy this company. Um, and, you know, what are the factors they're looking for? And I'll, I'll talk about sort of the fundamental value drivers that the big medical device companies are looking for. And, and here's the thing, it's, it's paradox, but you can always walk away. You don't necessarily need to, to sell your company. You don't have to. You can keep on running it for, for many years. And the way that Bayless did, they kept on running and running and running, became insanely valuable and eventually sold. But um, it's, so maybe I'll use an analogy to explain why. Let's say, so let's say, you, I don't know, there's a lot of people flipping houses. So let's say you, you buy a house and you put some money into it, you renovate it, and then you put it on the market. And, and all of a sudden, you get a ton of people wanting to buy it. It's just really high. And, and ignore the fact that you know real estate in Toronto and elsewhere in Canada is just insanely expensive to begin with. But if you put money into something and everyone wants to buy it, then it's like, okay, you don't necessarily need to sell it. What you could say is, you know what? Oh, I'm going to go look. Maybe I'm going to go look for some investors. I'm going to spruce up the property a little bit more, and then maybe it'll be even more valuable. That's really what I'm talking about, is you can, you always sort of have that optionality. Once somebody has, a, once somebody thinks you're valuable, to kind of walk away, and it gives you a ton of leverage. You could go, you could go public, you could do anything you want. Uh, but if you're, let's say you, you, you bought that house, you spruce it up a little bit, nobody really wants to buy it, it's going to be really, really difficult to get follow-on investment to spruce it up even more to try and, you know, again, build more value and sell that, that house. So it's, it's, it's a real paradox, uh, but it's essentially the, the way you, I believe, strategically, the way you maximize value is by building something that a lot of people want to acquire. So they're banging at your door and then deciding, well, maybe I will sell or maybe no, I'm just going to keep on kind of investing and building the company. Uh, you know, there's lots of tech examples of companies that have sort of turned down acquisition offers early and it ended up becoming much more valuable. Like Facebook, I think there was at one time Yahoo wanted to buy Facebook for a billion dollars. Facebook is worth a lot more today, despite all the evil it's done on the world. That's a separate matter. Um, but, the, uh, but here's the thing is, is that because Yahoo was already ready to buy them, it's such a premium. They had so much leverage to go out and raise capital and continue building this company. So I think that's that's a really really powerful thing is when you're when you're building a company when you're raising money, you have so much more leverage if you can construct something that something somebody at the end of the day a big multinational is going to want to buy because they'll assign a really big dollar value to that. Um, so what is it that uh, the big big acquirers are looking for? And it's three things, and these three things might appear self evident, but I think what's important here is they exist almost to the exclusion of many other things. Um, so a lot of other things you can think of that they might want, they don't necessarily want. It's really these three things. And there is a fair amount to unpack here in terms of what I mean. But, you know, I, I, for example, I talk about the US market, by far the most important, by far. Europe, elsewhere, no, quite frankly. Um, they just really care about the US. Um, you know, high margin recurring revenue, you might have, you know, I, I don't know, strategic transactions where you end up making lots of money, but if they're kind of one-off strategic transactions, do they care? No. It's really these three things, I think, that heuristically they kind of most focus on and, and, and most key on. And you can demonstrate these three things, you will have built a very, very valuable business. So first off, and again, these things might appear self-evident. They're not going to be... Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think anything I'm saying is, you know, totally shocking. You would have probably seen these things before, but it's how important they are. And I think, you know, if you, you're listening to somebody like Gary Gershoni after me, who's you know, far more experienced and, 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 and uh, um, far more esteemed, I suspect, I could be wrong, but I suspect if you kind of tease out from his presentation what he's talking, he's probably looking to invest in companies that will start exhibiting these things because he knows eventually this is what acquirers are going to want. So first thing is you just want big markets that are in need of innovation. You just, big markets matter. I'll explain why. Second thing is you need this technology to adopt in the US. You need to go after the US market. It is by far the most important. And lastly, you need high margin recurring revenue. So I will walk through what these three things mean. Again, they're not, you know, none of this is, is mystical. You wouldn't have never seen it before, but the importance is like, I mean, you, you really, really need to stay focused on, I think, these three things. So why are large markets so important? 
Well, it's because, you know, again, I've talked about, um, you know, sort of uh, global multinationals being sort of the, the epicenter of the medical device universe. They're huge. I mean, this is an industry that is insanely consolidated. Um, there aren't a lot of companies and the ones that, that do exist are just, they're very, very, very big. So these are, you know, some, these aren't necessarily the biggest, but these are pretty much top of the list. These are the revenues. And think about if you're a Medtronic and your, your expectation, Medtronic's a publicly traded company, there is expectation from their investors from Wall Street to continue growing and growing and growing. If Medtronic acquires a business that's doing, I don't know, 300 million in revenue, that's a rounding error. <laughs> that doesn't even, when I round up, that's not even rounding, right? And you think about it, if you're doing 300 million in revenue, how big is that market? We probably don't have all the market. So if you look at these companies, they are very, very big companies. There is a lot of pressure on them to, draw, to, to drive their top line. They are not going to be doing acquisitions that, for companies that are going after small markets. It is still possible to build a medical device company, excuse me, going after maybe a small niche market. It's still a possibility. Uh, but the likelihood of raising VC money and the likelihood of, of, of raising um, or getting acquired, and that's where, again, the big bucks are, the really, really, really big bucks, it's just so much lower. You need to be going after large, large, large markets in order to be attracting the interest of these companies. There's just no way around it. And again, if you, you know, all these companies are publicly traded, if you listen to the analyst calls and stuff like that, they're all talking about growing their top line. And they're all talking about big thematic things in, in, in medicine and technology that are sort of tailwinds that are going to help them achieve that. So this is it. This is, this is again, the reason why you need to be going after, uh, again, if you want to generate substantial value, uh, um, uh, sort of big market. So, so what is a big enough market? A, a big enough market is probably something, it needs to be at least 500 million or more, at least, like it's got to be. Um, and also, so total addressable market sort of stands for the total potential market. Um, and then CAGR is your compounding and your growth rate. So growing at least 10% per year. Obviously, you don't want something that's mature um, and, uh, and, and you want something that's perceived as, as growing and, and not sort of stale. And if you think about it, if, if a market's growing at 10% per year, in, in seven years, it's doubled. Um, so that's a pretty powerful force. So they like this kind of stuff. And again, it's not it's not actually how much revenue you have necessarily. I've seen companies, there was one new Vera that got bought by Boston Swepster, got bought before it had FDA clearance, but it was going into structural procedures that a lot of people see as like you know, structural heart procedures are growing like crazy. So it was clear that Biosense, which is a division of Johnson Johnson, saw that and they're like, okay, we want to be in the space, we need imaging, et cetera. So I would say that's kind of like the floor. Like if you don't see a market that that big and that growing, um, that's a big challenge. And one of the one of the challenges we've had at Canavi is with our Novasite system, which is an intracoronary imaging system, is the market's pretty bad. I mean, the market's uh, 650, 700. Uh, but for the longest time, it was stale. It was mature because there just wasn't a lot of evidence to support the outcomes or the cost effectiveness of, of imaging, which has now like totally changed. I mean, the last year or so, there's just been an abundance of evidence. Um, and, uh, and now the market's projected, I mean, there was a guideline change last year, the market's projected to, to perhaps um, double or triple in the coming years. Uh, so we're gonna see potentially a massive amount of growth. Uh, but it wasn't, the market was not perceived historically as one that was kind of growing and exciting and where there was a real fear of missing out. Like that is one thing that drives, again, people making acquisition decisions, they're just people, they're just people. And so like the fear of missing out, it applies to them too. They just, they don't wanna miss out. Um, the other thing is, you know, and this kind of ties in a little with my Canavi example, it needs to be conventionally acknowledged. I mean, and, and, and what I mean that it's like, it needs to be accepted that innovation is, is necessary and needed. And that was one of the things that we had at Canavi. It was like, people were like, well, it wasn't until very recently that people like really waked up to the idea of, um, yeah, intravascular imaging is super, super critical. Whereas again, historically it was like, eh, it, was, it wasn't too exciting. So, so the general consensus 
must be like, this thing is needed. And you need to be able to convince people reasonably quickly. And so, so another example is, let's say January, 2020. Let's say you have some sort of, I don't know, let's say you're working on a coronavirus vaccine and you're going around telling people the next big pandemic is probably going to be a coronavirus, right? You know, we've seen SARS, we've seen some other ones. I've got this platform. But people are like, okay, you know, the market for that potentially could be very, very large, could be huge, but nobody sees it as, a, as something urgent, right? If you were to fast forward three months, how much money has gone into COVID vaccines, right? Or, or COVID treatments or, or things like that. So it's not just a matter of the market potentially being large and growing, but it's also something that people have to see. Like if people don't see it, that's also extraordinarily difficult. I had an analogy that I was going to use. I scrapped it. Uh, it involved chess. And it involved uh, sometimes in chess, um, you know, people make the non-obvious move and they end up being right. But it's like, well, but you, the only way you're going to make the non-obvious move is you have to be brilliant. You have to see seven steps ahead and people are going to kind of lose faith and confidence in you. Unfortunately, medical device industry is one of those industries where people can see too far ahead. And we did it at Canavi. I was a rude awakening. Like I, I, we were thinking, Brian Courtney, brilliant guy. He's he was right. He was right all along. But it was only recently that he was kind of vindicated, and um, and and those companies as a whole. And uh, so so it is. There is such a thing in this industry as being smarter than it, and that can be a problem. You don't. You actually want to be smarter than just. I, it was funny. I, I remember going to conferences, and they were like. I'd see um, 10 companies working on mitral valve. I'm like, how many mitral valve companies are? Like, this is insane. There's just like an insane number of mitral valve companies. Um, or you can see like ablation companies or all sorts of things like for, for, um, uh, for arrhythmias. But it was, now it makes sense because like nobody is doubting that mitral valve is a huge problem and nobody is doubting that ablation is a huge problem. Now the dynamics of, you know, it's probably gonna be maybe a winner take all or a couple solutions take all, that's fine. But that's really what was kind of uh, motivating so much crowding, which is like everybody knew those were massive markets and nobody was doubting that it was a need. Um, so, and that was one thing, again, if I, you know, I were to rewind the clock five, six, seven years ago, uh, I just couldn't, I just couldn't get my head around. There is a question in the chat. I see somebody raised their hand. I'm happy to answer if you'd like to unmute. Yeah. Um, so, how do you deal with competition in this space? Because if you are a large market and it's obvious that a lot of people want to go into that space, but now you're also to get funding or to prove yourself, you're also dealing with the fact that you have other people interested in the same space. So like, how do you balance between a growing market and the competition that's in that space? Yeah, great question. So all things being equal, the larger the market, uh, the more people that are gonna wanna go into it, right? Like just like the mitral example, right? So it's like, well, how do you how do you compete with that? That's simple. It's IP. It's technology. So the great thing about Canada is that we produce excellent research. We're constantly coming up with great ideas, right? We have well-funded programs like Innovate. We can do things that other people can't do. I've been around the world talking to people about medical devices, and nobody doubts that Canada. Um, nobody does the research that we do. They, they see us as, you know, from a commercial standpoint as, you know, a very, very small player, which is fair. But from a research, I think they realize like, yeah, okay, this, this it, you know, Canada's a powerhouse. So the way you compete is in those large markets where you're absolutely right, where there's a lot of entrance is on IP and technology and ideas and innovation. And so all that other stuff you're learning about like clinical needs finding and, you know, invention and IP protection, extraordinarily important extraordinarily extraordinarily i'm not going to discount like i mean that is that is the crucible of everything is you need an extraordinarily good product that solves the clinical need um and you know you can get ip protection around and all that other kind of stuff um what i guess i'm saying is like if these other ingredients aren't there all the inventiveness in the world doesn't matter um so that's so like so so the again a medical device acquirer they're, everything to them is just about like top line, bottom line. And the, the things I'm showing are what drive their top line and bottom line. But to get there, you're absolutely right. You need IP and, and you, you need technology. And here's the other thing, the great thing about this industry 
is once you have a patent, you have a legal monopoly. Nobody else can quite, if you protect it properly, nobody else can quite do how you, what you are doing. So that is the way that you sort of compete. Um, does that make sense? Is there follow-up yeah. or hopefully? Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense, thanks. Okay. Um, so, so I think it's important is if you're going out there and you're saying like all oh, band-aids, you know, billion dollar market, billions of dollars and we need, you know, needs innovation, nobody's gonna be like band-aids, nobody cares. Um, you need, this is almost like a visceral thing. If you're talking to somebody in Medtronic or Boston or Johnson Johnson or wherever, or Stryker, or, and you're like, well, okay, this market, and they're like, no, you could be right. You could be absolutely right in the sense that three, four, five years from now, or even a couple months from now, if something drastic happens, um, that, that this will be a large market. But if people aren't seeing it, two wrongs don't make a right. Yes, Ahmed, I believe you have a question. Yeah, so sorry, something that um, I, I wanted to quickly uh, ask you, Stefano, here. So sometimes people uh, or innovators go after like a niche market, you know, with that probably have like an untapped business potential, which is part. So as an example, you were just talking about Band-Aids, maybe the Band-Aids for kids. Uh, that's where they're going to start, you know, working on. And then later on, they can, uh, you know, potentially enter the bigger market for, for, yeah. for, for that. Uh, what, what do you think about this strategy? It's, or, so niche markets, it's a possibility. The thing is, is like, this, you know, this ecosystem right here is, is a subset of transactions. It's not all of the medical device transactions that happen, uh, but it's the ones that tend to raise the most money, tend to be the best funded and tend to produce the best investor return. Um, so, uh, you know, again, it is, um, you know, you, there are other ways of, there are other perhaps strategies and things like that. This is what I've observed as sort of really what, what drives um, uh, sort of value creation. Now, now here's one thing is, is that when you're doing a product, a niche is different than a beachhead. A beachhead is when, you know, a product, so for example, with Canabi, uh, intravascular image, coronary intravascular imaging, applicable in a lot of circumstances. But we've kind of narrowed our beachhead to certain complex cases where we know that our technology is extraordinarily helpful. That's sort of a landing spot. And then we can kind of build from there within the same indication and whatnot. So I think the, um, I, you know, again, I, I won't necessarily rule out sort of niche technologies or whatnot, but in terms of, you know, big value creation, what's really going to drive shareholder return and driving shareholder return is, you know, is, is a product of, you know, raising capital, getting investor attention, getting acquirer attention. You, again, I think you got to be going after the big markets and you got to have just really, really, really compelling technology. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Um, there's another hand up. Yeah. Um, so thanks for the presentation. Um, my question to you was, uh, you mentioned that as a company and you're developing a product, you want to enter the market if the market is growing 10% a year, you know, new, exciting, and innovating. Um, I guess my question is how does this influence the way that healthcare is practiced? So, um, you know, as a large company, you want to push, maybe push is the wrong word, but you want to encourage healthcare practitioners or hospitals to use your product and implement your processes and use your software. Um, how does that kind of affect the way that healthcare culture is shaped by companies and industry? Um, and are there any ways of kind of monitoring this and making sure that healthcare standards are held in place irrespective of the trends growing in industry? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. It actually sort of leads me to uh, my next sort of um, uh, point, which is uh, in order to build a value company, you need clinical validation and adoption in the United States. And the United States is the market. I mean, there's these factors here, but it's the most malleable market. It is the, the market uh, that is probably, you know, if you look at sort of lobbying and advocacy efforts and stuff like that, and involvement by companies, it is probably the market where um, companies kind of have the most say in terms of being able to influence uh, what it is that providers are doing, uh, mainly because uh, there is a lot of money on the line, uh, but also because 
Um, the United States is a very competitive healthcare system. They want to be seen, at least in terms of like tertiary care and things like that, as, as the best. Um, now, just to sort of preempt this, what I will say is, is that um, there are a lot of checks and balances in healthcare, a lot of checks and balances. So you can't just come out with a technology and be like, this is the greatest thing ever. Everybody start using it, okay? So, I mean, it starts with... Um, it starts with the regulatory process, right? You know, and then the FDA, um, and you know, the, the FDA. I mean, vast majority of devices go through the the five ten k pathway, which is substantial equivalence, which isn't doesn't require clinical data, uh, but still requires benchtop data relative to a predicate to prove that you have the same safety and, and, and efficacy profile. Um, so there's that. So again, you can't. You, I mean, you can't market a device in the United States or any geography until you have approval or clearance. But the other thing is, is you know, medicine is regulated by the doctors, by the clinical societies and stuff like that. Um, in order to get adoption, in order to get guideline changes where your technology is being used and things like that, you need to bring the data. I mean, um, I'll give you an example. So, so intravascular imaging, intracoronary imaging, th there has been a lot of studies that have come out that have said, um, you know, hey, th you know, this, this, drastically reduces the incidence of major adverse cardiac events uh, by half, uh, probably for anywhere from about 11% to 5.5% over five years, which is huge. I mean, if, if somebody came out a stent that did that, it would be like game changing. Everybody would use that stent. Those studies were done in South Korea and China, which is probably the biggest downfall or the biggest drawback. The, the American College of Cardiology has basically been saying, no, we want U.S. data. Like we want you, we want it done here. We want it. We want to see it done on American patients, because you know. I mean, it's, there's there's a fair objection. I mean, patients around the world can be different sizes, different complexity of heart disease, and things like that. So I think wanting things domestically, I think there's a fair argument. But it's not like we're going around and lobbying and saying like, no. I mean, you got to use this. But like we, you got to bring the data. Like this is a very, very data-driven industry. And, and certainly there are instances where there's conflicts of interest, where physicians are promoting products that maybe they shouldn't. But if you look at, I mean, the United States has implemented a lot, the Sunshine Act, there's a, an anti-kickback law. Um, they've done a lot to put controls in place such that the devices that are being used are ones that actually have a bona fide impact on patients in the healthcare. Well, I mean, the healthcare system, pay, I mean, cost, that's another factor, but actually improving patient outcomes, that's one where they're, they're, super, they're super fixated. So I don't have, if somebody brings a product to market and it's being used, I, I don't think that the reason that's happening is because you know, they've, they've somehow manipulated things or, or lied or cheated in any respect. I think they've, they've shown the data and it, there's, there's more than enough to, to say that the, the US especially, they will only adopt on the, on the basis of data, so. Hopefully that answers your question. I think it's, it's fair to be reasonably skeptical, but at least from what I've seen, um, fortunately, there's a lot of um, uh, very scrupulous doctors out there uh, that are really, really demanding in terms of the, the, the data they want to see before they adopt. That's very sure. Thanks. Two questions in the chat. Let's see. Um, oh, these are from... Uh, so somebody has a question. Are there any analogies for disruptive technologies in the healthcare system? Would something disruptive not be conventionally acknowledged as needed? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, um, I use the example of COVID vaccines, right? I mean, you could have been developing COVID vaccines before the pandemic. Nobody would have thrown, given you a dime. Nobody would have given you anything. Fast forward a couple months. So that's, and again, like the, the, a total addressable market sort of, it factors in what's the expected market. Like how, how large should it be? And the likelihood of there being a pandemic, you know, in hindsight was actually quite large. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's an example where, um, uh, I mean, you know, God, God forbid, God forbid, you know, nuclear arms start getting used, you know, in, in the conflict that's ongoing. Think about the demand now for, you know, sort of like radiation safety and stuff like that globally, right? You try to pitch somebody today on LEDs that you need to walk around on a day-to-day -day basis, nobody's going to give you a dime. God forbid something happens, it could change real quick. So those external factors, certainly not always within our control. I think I'm really running <laughs> behind time. So maybe I'll try to speed up here. I mean, I told you it was going to be like a five minute chat. So, so 
Totally fine, Stefano. <laughs> okay, so um, so the U.S. is the center of the Medicaid ecosystem, and you really so the acquirers are looking for evidence of adoption here. And why is that? Number one, it's where the vast majority of multinationals are located. I mean, Medtronic is an Irish company, but that's sort of in legal name only. They're they were born and bred out of Minneapolis. Um, that's where people are. So that's where the people making the deals are. Uh, it's by far the biggest portion of the medical device market. It's about 40%. I mean, last I sort of read, it's about $160 billion. Um, it's unique in the fact that it's there's competition among providers. I mean, never I'll never forget flying out of Boston and in the Boston airport, seeing an ad for like an orthopedic doctor from uh, there's Brigham Women's or whomever. Like, you don't see that in Canada. But in, in the United States, they compete for patients. And a lot of that sort of factors into their decision to procure tech new technologies. They want to be seen as sort of the, the early adopters to attract patients. And then lastly, they tend to have, you know, by virtue of, of some, you know, um, uh, provider reimbursement and some other factors, tend to have a disproportionate number of specialists and KOLs as well. So really it is, I think, the, the reference market and the market where people requires really, really, really want you to succeed. And, you know, again, there's a lot of other important markets out there, but, and this was a rude awakening for Canavi because we've done a lot of stuff in Asia and elsewhere. But after we show them these, you know, distribution agreements with lots of, you know, big revenues and stuff like that, they said, well, what are you doing in the US? And it's like, well, our production capacity is tied up with selling to Asia. We're like, sorry. So fortunately we, you know, we now have the resources and we've sort of reconfigured things to be able to focus on the United States. But quite frankly, this is a little bit sad. I mean, if I was starting a company today, our involved, for example, in XPAN, we have no plans currently in Canada. We'd like to be able to get to Canada at some point uh, to A, help Canadians. And B, there, I mean, there are some tactical reasons. It would be great to be able to go down the street to see your device being used as opposed to having to fly south of the border. Uh, we, you know, we have a system right now at Sunnybrook that's being used by Brian Courtney. That's great. But all things being equal, what you really, really want to do is crack that US nut. So you really want to, and, and here's the other thing is, is that markets are difficult. I mean, um, so you go, let's see me go to the next slide. Um, you know, markets, you know, you, there, you know, every market has sort of, you know, regulatory different requirements and things like that, and maybe different product needs and, and whatnot. I, I mean, focus is really important when you're an early stage company and investors generally do not like companies that are spread too thin. So what is, um, you know, what does clinical validation adoption in the United States look like? Well, first off, it's getting a certain number of academic and community users. I don't know the number. It sort of depends on the company. You might not even, I mean, with number two, you might not even need it necessarily. Um, but, uh, but you need, you know, all things being like for Canavi, we're really trying to get a really nice mix of people or, or users and academic sites that will then become sort of the KOLs the podium speakers and whatnot that maybe will will be involved in research studies and things like that. Also, community users, just general sort of day to day users um, that um, you know that make up the sort of the, the vast majority of hospitals uh, in, in the United States. So, so that's what we're going after. And again, the exact number it varies by company, um, but it's good to to sort of hit that mix. And also, you know, as, as you're building your company and you're building your sort of your your launch strategy to figure out, okay, what is enough to make an, an acquirer interested. Um, and actually one of the best pieces of advice I ever heard was you should figure out who your acquirer's key opinion leaders are because they are the people for a given technology because they are the people that ultimately the acquirer is gonna listen to when they say, is this bona fide or does this make sense? So you need to know for your acquirer, who is it that, which physicians do they listen to? And if you can target them, if you can get the product in their hands, that's great. The second thing, you know, I, I sort of talked about data before, clinical programs and strategies. This is absolutely critical. So, you know, the, the biotech industry, for example, every drug needs to go through a phase three, a big randomized control study, right, to demonstrate its safety and efficacy. It's not the case in medical devices for regulatory approval, but it really is for adoption. You need a lot of data to be able to show people hey, this is better, less expensive, et cetera. And you really need to be thinking about what clinical program and strategy is going to be enough uh, to, to be able to, to, to A, sway physicians and B, sort of 
no, physicians and, and, and hospitals and eventually sway acquirers. So there are some technologies, there are some medical device technologies that goes through sort of pivotal, as part of the PMA process or the pre-market approval process, they go through a pivotal sort of study. I remember Medtronic, there was a renal denervation technology and, and it was basically like a make or break study. Like it was, um, you know, if this succeeds, it's great. If it doesn't, not, not good. Um, it's very binary. And for that reason, companies tend to avoid them. Uh, but if you can get really, really, really compelling data, that really helps drive the process. So I think the, um, and again, it's a, if you run like a randomized control study that's big and powered and has amazing endpoints, you might not even need any sort of adoption because an acquirer is just going to look at the data and say, this is a no brainer. This is like any sort of, um, uh, you know, any, you know, whether, so one thing to note is clinical guidelines and reimbursement, they're all driven by data. And so they're going to look at that and be like, well, you know, if you have a really compelling data for a new technology or something like that, well, we have to change the guidelines to be able to use this. And therefore, people using it, we have to make sure that they have the money to be able to do so. So that clinical program and strategy is incredibly important. I think, you know, again, these, these start flowing into tactical decisions, how you do this, but this needs to be done. And absent this, an investor just will not, or sorry, uh, uh, an acquirer and therefore an investor just will not be able to check that box to say, okay, yeah, this is something that's that, that I want to see that's progressing. So I think that's, that's something that's really critical. I'm going to see, there's another question in the chat. Somebody said, that is scary. I'm not sure. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry. Sorry. I mean, I didn't, you know, I think they're referring to the nuclear. <laughs> sorry. But it's, I mean, you know, some, some people have heard about black swans and, and whatnot. You know, um, black swan doesn't exist until you see one for the first time. These sort of like uh, low probability events that have a massive impact. I I'm telling these people that like within my brain, nothing is outside the realm of possibility. Um, so I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare anybody, but uh, it's possible. Anything's possible, right? Like, and so, um, and, you know, again, decade in med tech, that's another thing that I've learned is, you know, try to expect the unexpected. Um, so the last thing, the last factor, uh, is as it relates to high margin recurring revenue. And in order to understand why this is so important, you have to understand the, the, the income statement of, of a big medical device company. So this is, so every time a big, so if you, if you, you know, Medtronic, Boston, whomever, if you were to look at their income statement, basically they would spend about 40, 40 cents on the dollar on COGS, cost of goods sold. Um, so they have a gross margin of about 60%. Sales is about 20%, G&A 10%, R&D 5%. So they're left over before taxes. And a lot of them are very good at dodging taxes. Uh, I mentioned Medtronic in Ireland. It was entirely for tax reasons. An operating margin of 25%. So what's interesting is, is that if you look at sales and marketing, that's pretty much a fixed expense. Um, what, you know, they, they have sort of these sales forces. In a lot of cases, giving them another technology to sell doesn't really result in them having to spend more money. G&A, finance, lawyers, et cetera. Acquiring a product doesn't really change that. R&D is actually completely discretionary. So it's not really a function of revenue. So as a result, so operating leverage is the, the concept that a dollar of revenue kind of really hits the bottom line. Like if you have a dollar revenue and 25 cents of that is hitting the bottom line, that's really, really, really nice. As opposed to, I don't know, grocery stores have like no operating leverage. I mean, think about how much they have to sell just to, to get like a dollar of profit. So one thing to know about these acquirers, they have really, really, really big operating leverage. And therefore they want companies with A, really high margins and B, things that they can sell over and over and over and over and not just one-time sales. As I mentioned, like the, the, the medical device companies, they're really, really evaluated on their top line, how much revenue they're getting and what their earnings per share are. They don't like to acquire companies that they're just gonna have to sink a bunch of money into and, uh, and, and you know, wait, and, and, you know, maybe something comes up. Uh, they would much rather pay a premium for something that is generating a lot of revenue and really good margins now. So, you know, what is gross margin? For those of you who haven't studied finance or whatever, it's not a complicated, it's not a like a concept. Your gross margin is basically your sales price. It's called your ASP minus your cost of goods sold. So it's how much you're selling something for versus how much it's actually costing production to make it. So how do you drive your margin? It's two ways. You can either drive your, you can either increase your sales price 
or you can lower your cost of goods sold. So how do you drive your sales price? A lot of that is through the reimbursement process. Um, so if you can demonstrate, again, it requires a lot of data, but you can demonstrate that your technology is new, novel, improves outcomes, et cetera, you could perhaps go to uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and maybe get what's called a, a pass-through code initially in order to get a little bit more, more, a little bit more reimbursement, at least in an outpatient setting. Inpatient's a lot harder. Um, so that's like data is what ends up driving your ability to charge more. Um, certainly you can price based on what competing devices are and comparable devices, but if you really, really want to charge a premium, um, you have to bring the data. Like you really have to show, hey, this thing works. And then the other factor of the equation is, you know, your cost of goods sold. I mean, you, you know, trying to manufacture each component for less, you don't necessarily need, by the way, an acquisition is kind of interesting. Sometimes you don't always need to have to do it but there needs to be a really, really clear plan for like, okay, we can get this down. And ideally the margins that you're looking at um, are, you know, 60, 70, 80%, you know? So if you're selling something for a thousand dollars a unit, it shouldn't cost more than two to 300 to make it. Um, you know, there's a company that I'll just, I'll about to show you a Nari uh, that went public last year, year before, whatever, thrown back to me device for Venus procedures. Margins are like 90%. And their, you know, their stock price is through the roof. Great, people love them. And it's like, I mean, it's amazing. And it's, it's uh, that is like your prototypical. You can, and you should be able to. By the way, I mean, you know, a lot of time margin erosion is driven by competition because the more players, you know, price comes down and stuff like that. You got a legal monopoly if you got the patents. So all you need to do is be able to show the data that uh, you know you you can kind of convince the the pairs. And that's not an easy that's not an easy path. Um, but, uh, you know, that's sort of, you know, again, how you, how you drive that margin, uh, and then recurring revenue. And there's kind of, you know, two ways of, of generating recurring revenue. The most obvious is just single use disposable. So something that somebody uses once and they have to throw away. So this is the Inari device, the flow retriever. It's basically for removing blood clots and veins and it's done extraordinarily well. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, it's just somebody uses and they throw it away, but you know, they've generated a lot of data. They've gotten a lot of use extraordinarily, extraordinarily attractive. Um, capital equipment, and one of the things that's um, uh, important to note is hospitals operating budgets, you know, that's where they get paid per procedure. They get paid to do things. Um, so every time a device is used in a procedure, typically it's sort of applied against whatever reimbursement they receive. Capital equipment, that's totally different reimbursement or, or budgeting process. That they don't get money specifically for to buy capital, to buy things that are not sort of used at one time during the procedure. So they have to go to their surpluses, their foundations, things like that. Um, capital, and this is, by the way, this is the Reflexion sort of um, system. Some people might've heard of this company. Uh, it's done, done pretty well. It's privately held right now. Some sort of um, uh, uh, radiotherapy device for, for cancer. Um, but it is possible, you know, capital typically you just sell it once and it's done. That's not necessarily the case. There are ways of turning capital into recurring revenue, uh, maybe through sales of software or data or something like that, or other disposables that you add on. Uh, but it's really, really important, I think, when you're structuring what it is that you're selling, that it's something that you can keep on selling to the hospital over and over and over and over, um, as opposed to just a one-time sale where then you walk away and you say, okay, that's it. Um, so the combination of margin and recurring revenue is salivating for acquirers. They just, they just love it. So yeah, again, you know, at scale, you want to be at 70%. Um, all things being equal, you probably want to go down the disposable route as opposed to the capital equipment route. Again, it's still possible to get recurring revenue from capital equipment, depending on how you structure it. But the thing is, is that it actually is a huge cash flow sink if you're selling capital equipment. The reason being is, is that you know, think, think about like, think about if you lease a unit and, you know, leasing kind of varies based on hospital systems. Some like it, some don't, but let's say you have to spend, I don't know, a million dollars on a unit. And then, you know, you lease it $200,000 a year for 10 years. I don't know, something like that. Well, you had to spend that, that million dollars up front to, to be able to, to get that thing um, built. Um, so even though like, over the life of the, the, the technology, you'll make a million dollars profit and that's 50% you know, margin, pretty good. Um, and still, it can be a huge cash sink uh, when you're when you're selling capital equipment. So your whether this something is recurring revenue or how it is recurring revenue is extraordinarily important. Uh, the um, uh, the acquirers really really like to see that. I'm being very mindful of time. Maybe I'll go back to the chat. 
Um, okay, sorry. Yeah, that was just the <laughs> me scaring everybody. Um, so you know, the, the last thing, um, and and is you know, some some people might have heard of this, something called the Dunning Kruger effect is this idea where, where you learn something or you get involved in something and then you immediately think you're an expert and then, but you're not. And then, you know, as time goes on, you kind of learn you're not and then, you know, kind of goes back up and you realize, okay, maybe I do know something. And yeah, I mean, the peak of my Mount Stupid was not sort of fully understanding and realizing some of these strategic things um, that I've sort of tried to convey to you today. And and it's like now to me, they're obvious um, that, you know, maybe it's something you just kind of have to learn through experience. But early on, I was kind of so focused with tactical stuff. And you do have to be focused on tactical stuff because it matters. Again, you can't, if you're, if you're pointing in the right direction, but you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not rowing properly, your oar is broken or something like that, you're not going to get anywhere. But I think that's, you know, if I look back again in the last 10 years where my peak of Mount Stupid was, that was it, was not sort of some of these big, 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 big strategic things, you know, not resonating. And they didn't resonate not because I was stupid, um, was I think I just needed to, it's sort of like an exam, right? And, and so there's two ways of writing an exam. You can kind of, I don't know, like just give the marker what they're looking for, or you can make it a much more academic exercise. Um, I would recommend not. I would just recommend giving the marker what they're looking for. Uh, because that will, um, that will really is what generates returns. And again, I think if we have enough of these companies in Canada that sort of get seeded and grow and are, are, are really attractive to acquirers, I think we will actually end up getting more anchored companies because they'll be so valuable, they will have the option to be able to say, no, I don't want to be fired. I'm, I'm okay with walking away. So anyways, that is the, I think I'm like now right on time. So that's the end of the, uh, the presentation. I've got my sort of details there. Feel free to reach out. I also got my lead chess. If anyone wants to challenge me to a game of chess, I'm currently pretty terrible. Um, but uh, yeah, happy to, to turn it back to, to, to questions. Thank you very much, Stefano. That was a very insightful and engaging oh. session as usual. Um, I appreciate you taking the time again this year to share those lessons learned and best practice from your experience in the medical device sector. Um, yeah, let's open up for questions. If <laughs> The first one is I have a chess.com account. Yes, I do. It's Stefano21. It used to be my old account. I switched to, to Lee Chess because <laughs> it's free. So it's just the Stefano21 there. And by the way, you're... I got 1450, so whatever that, in, in, in chess.com. And so just, so I'm either really good or really bad compared to how good you are. Yeah. And you're very good in responding to in emails, by the way. So I'm pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, any I other actually, questions? Let's I, see who's on. Let's see. By the way, let's see who's on the line and see if any names are recognized. Uh, yeah. I might pick on them to ask questions. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah. So this is a so, you know, for diagnostic medical devices. Who pays for the device? Um, the, the, the unfortunate fact of the matter is, is that um, in, in the healthcare system, people, they, they only really, I mean, they pay for outcomes. So, I mean, even look at Canavi, which is an imaging technology, which is our, our um, intravascular imaging system. But in order to really get it used, we have to show that this, that the use of this imaging drives an improvement in outcomes. Um, the same with diagnostics, diagnostics, especially molecular diagnostics, very, very, very difficult. You really, really have to show that um, you are driving an improvement in, in outcomes. And you know, molecular diagnostics within the US and Canada, there are paths to reimbursement. But all things being equal, um, therapeutic devices have a way, way, way easier time uh, because their endpoints are that much more obvious. Um, so it's, it's unfortunate, uh, but that's, that's the healthcare system. It, it, healthcare system pays for, for therapeutics um, or outcomes. Yeah, point of care device. I mean, you know, it's, um, yeah, so, so if you have, okay, so let's say you have, um, you know, there, was, there was a company in Toronto, and I won't name the name, it's no longer in business, but it was developing a, um, a point of care for sexually transmitted infections. And it was to be, you know, so you wouldn't have to wait seven days from a central lab. And, and you know, in that case, yeah, I mean, it was done in the primary care physician's hospital. 
Um, how is the primary care physician getting compensated? I think it was just their regular consult fees. I, I don't know if there was, you know, I, I don't know at that point whether maybe there was a path for them to be able to get some add-on reimbursement and whatnot. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, all things being equal, you know, it, it's kind of like the where you want to pick on uh, is is the hospital setting. Um, and, and you know, the other thing to note is the the, the major medical device companies, uh, they uh, they most of their reps are in the hospital setting. And so when you talk about that operating leverage and sales and marketing, um, they want devices that they can give their their salespeople. Um, and, and that's, you know, and, and so if they're already in the hospital, they don't want to give them something where they have to go to a GP's clinic. Um, it's an area I probably, you know, diagnostics, um, you know, I'm not as familiar, especially if it's something of a molecular nature, I'm not as familiar with. Uh, but um, my previous company was actually molecular diagnostics, which is kind of interesting, but it's, that was a long time ago. Uh, but it's, yeah, I don't know. I just, I find it to be a lot trickier. Um, yeah, and, and, uh, and maybe I have less of a kind of a formula for that than I do for, for, for sort of typical medical devices. I, I mean, I, I sit on the, the board of the, or the commercialization advisory committee, Paul and Boerview, uh, and, you know, and that's the, the rehab hospital. And they're constantly coming up, with, you know, with, with great technologies for, for kids and stuff like that and, you know, uh, for, for rehab. And I'm like, I, I don't know how the rehab setting works. I'm sorry. All I know is, is that stuff that's sort of used specifically in the hospital. So I, I don't understand, or I'm not as nearly as immersed in those dynamics. So that's maybe a non-answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I do have a question for you, Stephanie. You, I'm sorry. You, you've done a great job in raising millions of dollars for Canavi from multiple sources. And I think your presentation covered very well, you know, how entrepreneurs can best position themselves for success in their fundraising efforts. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested uh, you know, in the different perspective here, how how can innovators go about choosing the right investors for their startups? Yeah, I think so. First off, I've raised a lot of money, but I haven't returned any money to shareholders. And and, and in my opinion, raising money is not an accomplishment. Returning money to shareholders is, and, and so that's the first thing is is that that's just a means to an end. So I, I don't actually feel much of an accomplishment. In fact, you know, we closed you know, 20 million US last year. And since then, I probably never felt quote unquote more nervous because there's a lot of expectations to deliver for somebody who's giving you 20 million US. It's not like they're, they're doing it and they're saying like, give it a go, like see how you turn out. It's like, no, you got to execute. You got to, you got to deliver. So that's the first thing is, you know, raising money gives you um, uh, places a, a great burden and responsibility on you. Uh, but I think it's, if you have, a great technology that's set up in a way that will drive value and drive adoption, people will see it. People will see it. Then they'll, they'll appreciate it. Um, so as you know, you sort of have to get out and, you know, market yourself and draw some attention, but you know, all things being equal, you could take, I don't know, the smartest finance dude in the room, give him a crappy technology. He's not going to, or he or she, sorry, is not going to raise nearly as much as somebody that's just developed a really, really, really intriguing product. Um, and again, there are some tactical things around that, um, but all things being equal, you know, investors, I mean, they, they want products, they want technologies, they want to, you know, they want new stuff and things like that. They're out there, they're seeing things. Um, so as long as you're not hiding under a blanket, uh, you know, you're, you're bound to run into somebody. And, and yeah, and I think it's, um, uh, but I think if, if you have the core stuff in place, if you have, again, you know, again, it absolutely starts with the innovation. Um, making sure it's protected, all that kind of stuff, but further, you know, making sure that you're kind of hitting all these fundamental value drivers, people will, will pick up on it. Um, like it's not going to be that, like it, it really, 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 really simplifies the problem. I mean, raising money is still not easy, but it is far, far easier with this than if you're going off script. Um, this is a, again, this is a script that major medical device companies have seen tons of time, they know it works, they like it, give them what they want. So if you're showing them something that they've seen before, yep. you know, pattern recognition, heuristics, blah, 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 they'll, they'll like you, they'll like you. And you'll start seeing money kind of flowing in your direction. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, more questions in the chat. 
Yes. Uh, yes, it does not end after raising money is like, it's probably the, the thing, you know, somebody were to ask me my best finance trait is I actually um, treat investor money more sacred than my own. Like to me, somebody giving me money is like the most, it's a pretty sacred bond. I do not take it lightly. Like I, yeah, I, so yeah, I probably am more diligent with cannabis money than even my own. So the big stakes and you're, you're sort of a trustee for somebody else's money. So I think, um, yeah. And, and yeah, it's all about returning money to people. They're not, you know, as much as in the medical device industry, we're trying to do things that help patients and that, that motivates a lot of people. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you are a fiduciary for investor money. You have a responsibility to manage it properly and try to return as much as possible. Uh, another question here, what can a company do with their devices? Uh, expensive capital equipment, what are solutions to those capital problems? Especially if the expensive capital equipment is a sustainable solution to some use disposals. I mean, great question. I, I know, um, uh, so, so first off, like if you're just looking at it from a cash flow perspective, um, it's, it's, it's definitely manageable. Uh, so one company that I got acquired recently in Toronto, 70 Surgical, um, they have a, um, a device. It was, you know, the company was came out of Sunnybrook, started by Victor Yang um, and a bunch of others. Uh, it's sort of a, a surgical system for, for spinal and neural procedures, et cetera. Um, but, you know, th their device, I don't know how much it costs. I think it was like about half a million. Um, but small company, I think by the time they were done, they had only raised about 20 million. Um, what they would do is essentially, you know, when they sold it to a clinic and the clinic would buy it uh, straight up is, oh, sorry, no, the, the, sorry, the clinic would not buy it straight up. The clinic would enter into a funding agreement with a third party that would essentially buy it from um, uh, or 7D at a discounted price. So let's say the unit, hypothetically, these are hypothetical numbers. Say the unit is uh, 500,000. Um, the, the third party might buy it uh, for 400,000. And then the lease payments to the clinic over the life of the product would might equal 500,000. So they would get their return. So from a cash flow perspective, there's, there's ways of working around it. Um, the, you know, what becomes more challenging is maybe the recurring revenue thing. Um, it's tricky. It's, I mean, you know, you hear, you'll hear this a lot is, is that acquirers general, and I've, I've heard this, acquirers just generally don't want capital. Uh, they, they want stuff that they can just sell over and over and over and over. And it's interesting because like, uh, Philips, Siemens, and a lot of big iron companies have been on buying sprees for companies that do sell disposables and things like that, because they realize, let's say you sell a cath lab and OR or something like that. That's once every 10 years. It's a massive contract. It's huge revenue, but it's once every 10 years. We want to see these people more. We want to have more engagement, more involvement. We learn more. We, 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 we're more frequent. So um, capital is a tricky one. And all things being equal, yeah, I mean, if I had a choice between a single use disposable company and a, uh, and, uh, a capital company, the single use disposable is probably going to win out. Not to say, I mean, there's a lot of great capital stuff, right? And I see some stuff like the reflection. I mean, what Synapt is doing is like blowing. That's like, like that's amazing. But you know, from an economic standpoint, it does. There's tactical ways around it, absolutely. But strategically, it does sort of create some some challenges. Yeah, another question. Yeah, um, so I just want to clarify, when we talk about med tech, we're separating it from digital, digital tech? Like, are we only talking about the hardware, not the software that goes along with it? No, not necessarily. I, I'm, when I say medical technology, I'm, I'm really talking about uh, devices that are used in kind of intervention, typically in a hospital setting or mm -hmm. some sort of clinical setting. Um, okay. Maybe. So I'm not, I'm not talking about like an app on your phone that you can use to monitor your heart rate. But even within a hospital, data is extraordinarily important. I mean, it's, uh, you know, like one of the advantages of capital that you don't get with disposables, like a NARI, their device doesn't capture any data, right? Like it doesn't, like actually the, Ahmed would know this, but 99.9% .9 of the data that exists in the hospital is in the form of images. So if you have an imaging technology, you have an abundance of data that can be extraordinarily valuable. Now, cybersecurity and stuff like that is, pretty tricky, but that's a tactical thing that you can navigate around. But yeah, I mean, no, so, so anything within the hospital, maybe not like EMRs, like medical record stuff, that, that's not really within scope. But yeah, if you have, 
like if you have a technology uh, that in there that does some imaging, that captures the imaging, captures the patient profile, sends it back to a server somewhere that does a bunch of AI, blah, 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 and then can develop sort of algorithms, prognostic, predictive, whatever. Yeah, no, that's sort of within scope of, of, of what I'm thinking. If that makes sense. Right. And that 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 software would be what investors are looking for. So it's not, so it might be initially a capital equipment because you bought the equipment, but that equipment runs with a software that yeah. could generate revenue. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Like that is, I mean, software, if you talk about what has the highest margins, software. Okay. I mean, because think about it, every time you like, uh, you know, every time, I mean, think about, I don't know, some of the whatever SaaS companies or blah, 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 or, you know, that are out there on Facebook. I mean, every time, you know, they, or whomever, Google, every time they sell you something or you click on an ad, how much did it cost them to, to produce that ad or whatever? It's nothing. I mean, it's like the software is all there. It's all it's all like a fixed cost that you have to incur up front and then it's done. So yeah, the software economics are, are excellent once once you've sort of gotten in there into the hospital. Okay. Sounds good, thank you. Yeah, I, I just have a quick comment, uh, Stefano, um, for uh, I think Sean's earlier question about, you know, disruptive innovations and if, uh, uh, you know, disruptive uh, innovations are not could not be conventionally acknowledged as needed. I, I think a, a good example that came to mind is that there is sometimes um, uh, there is a type of disruptive innovation where there is a new process or procedure or technique or product that creates a new market uh, and sometimes challenges the way things are done uh, and might not apparently have a strong, well-documented need, but holds a lot of promise of creating, you know, paradigm shifts and changes, uh, the standard doing things. And what comes to mind is the TAVI procedures, uh, you know, as opposed to do op doing open heart surgeries to implant new heart valves. Now these procedures uh, are, are being done through minimally invasive uh, techniques. Um, and I, I think the idea have seen a lot of like strong resistance for like from cardiac surgeons for for a long period of time, but it's fair. No, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, it, it eventually made its way in, in into the market and became a standard procedure. Absolutely, and yeah. Uh, yeah, but but it was pretty obvious at least immediately that you know the ability to do um, aortic valve replacements percutaneously, like if you could do that, well, that's really really attractive to yeah. at least the medical device mar or industry. So certainly, yeah. no, absolutely. So, so that that's a good example. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank well, you. I guess I will adjourn. I perhaps I will hand it over to to, to Gary. Um, <laughs> who's, uh, again, as I said before, far more esteemed and accomplished than I am. So, um, but uh, and and again, encourage you to sort of the things that I've I've shared today. Um, you know, this is sort of you know my perspective, what I've learned. Uh, but there are certainly other people out there that have uh, you know very very valuable insights to share. Well, that was great. Thank you so much, Stefano, uh, for taking the time to educate our students and people and uh, sharing uh, lots of your experiences and insights on how to pursue innovation and fund, uh, approach fundraising in a medical device field. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, we are going to take a few minutes break and we'll start at six o'clock with Dr. Gary Gershoni. Um, so see you shortly.